This is the Can Crushers Wrestling Podcast. The following contest is scheduled for one fall. Let's go nuts! It's Jimmy Nuts! Drive out of the car! With your host, Mark Martinez. Remember, just because you're trash doesn't mean you can't do great things. And the English professor. It's called a garbage can, not a garbage cannot. Hey, this is former WWE superstar Duke, the dumpster, Drosy, and you are listening to the Can Crushers Podcast. And welcome back to another Can Crusher Spotlight. I am your host, Mark Martinez, and in studio, well, we're really not in studio, we're in dining room. Yeah, we're in my dining room. Is the English professor, Mr. John Padlano. John, it's been a while since you've been on for a spotlight, so this must mean something special is coming. Yeah, I didn't want to miss this one. We've got a really special guest Um He's involved in the business, he's a fan of the business, um, and he is the associate producer of two really important uh, pieces of art that have to do with pro wrestling. What are they? Uh, 350 Days, a documentary, and The Wrestler starring Mickey Rourke and Marissa Tomei. Yeah, guys, our guest is Mr. Evan Ginsberg. We've been talking to him back and forth on Facebook a little bit, and... He, he's a great guy from Facebook. I can't wait to get on the phone with him and talk, John. So many questions about 350 Days and what's going on in wrestling today. Yeah, I, I love the movie The Wrestler. I had not heard of 350 Days until you told me about uh, your interaction with Mr. Ginsburg and that you had seen it and you said you have to see this. Since then, I've honestly watched it about four or five times. Uh, it, it's really good. If you love wrestling, you love good documentaries, guys, you need to see this. And uh, we're going to pick his brain a little bit about um, what went into to making these movies. Yeah, I've watched it a couple times as well, and it's you pull something different each time that you watch it. It's that type of documentary. You just It's not that you're glazing over something from the beginning. It's just you're like, how did I miss that on the third watch? Right. It, it's so good, you guys. Yeah. Um, there's some questions I definitely have for him that uh, I want to get to right now. Yeah, but let's talk about collar and elbow first because we have to. Al Snow is our boy. All right, I don't want to jump the gun here. Yeah, I mean, you got your shirt on right now. I do. Hats, yes. hoodies, tees, and they're comfortable. I, I continue to say the comfort level of these shirts are my favorite. The truth is I'm still in my jammies, and my jammy is my collar and elbow t-shirt. Yeah, it's great. Guys, and when you check out, you can check out with a special promo code. It is Can Crushers, capital C and Can, capital C and Crushers. You'll get an extra 10% off of whatever they're doing. So make sure you head over to Collar and Elbow and use that Can Crusher code. But let's hear from Al. Let's, let's call Evan, please. Yeah, let's do it. Wrestling. A love and a passion we all share. I've started a wrestling brand. The wrestling brand. A brand founded on the aspects of wrestling. Two entities working together to create a product that connect emotionally for people everywhere. Collar and Elbow is the brand. Passion and love for wrestling is the drive. I am Al Snow, and this is Collar and Elbow, the wrestling brand. And welcome back to Can Crusher Spotlight. I am the English professor. I am here alongside Mark the Mark. We are joined today by Evan Ginsberg. Um, if uh, you are not familiar with that name, you certainly will be by the end of this interview. Uh, but maybe you're familiar with the names Mickey Rourke, Marissa Tomei, Brett the Hitman Hart, um, Ox Baker, on and on and on, Angelo Savaldi. Okay, um, okay, okay. Let's, yeah, you guys get the picture. You get the picture. Let's bring Mr. Ginsburg on the show. Please. Welcome to the show, Mr. Ginsburg. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Mr. Ginsburg, uh, so much to talk about. Uh, it, it, 
350 days between the two of us. I think we've watched it now on Amazon 15 times. What an wow. amazing documentary. We loved it. We uh, The nuances of it. It's unbelievable. Before we get into it, we want to tell everybody that you're the associate producer of The Wrestler and 350 Days, and you also have some other stuff out there as well, correct? Yes, yes. Um, also on Amazon Prime, we did an old documentary called Wrestling Then and Now with uh, Killer Kowalski, Nikolai Volkov, Homicide, you know, tons of my friends, and basically... Um, you know, it's, it's amazing when you create art 17, 18 years later, you know, it's still out there and people are enjoying it. So you can check that out as well. Uh, I think what we want to do today is get an idea maybe of how you got into wrestling uh, when you first discovered it. Um, Mark wants to handle that aspect of it. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, The Wrestler and 350 Days since uh, between the two of us, myself and Mark, I am more of the um, literary genius, more of the thespian. Um, I've got that background, so I'll cover that. But Mark wants to go ahead and, and kind of find out some things about uh, why you love wrestling so much. Yeah, what, what, sure. what got you into wrestling? Who was the first person? Because we start all this. This is one of my favorite questions. Who said to a, a little Evan, hey, you have to watch this? What, who introduced you to wrestling? Well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Uh, I'm 103 years old. So, so <laughs> back, in the, back in the day, before there were thousands of cable channels, there were basically 13 channels and what was called the UHF dial. So on one cold, rainy, nasty day, I'm 12 years old, and I'm flipping the UHF dial, and all of a sudden I see this, huge monster pounding on this Indian. And I'm like, what is this? I didn't even know what it was. It was Chief J. Strongbow on a TV match, old school WWWF. And I, you know, I'm, I'm a kid, and I'm like just fascinated. And all of a sudden, he does this, like this herky-jerky war dance, and he conquers this monster. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is like... Marvel superheroes, you know, and supervillains, and I start watching this. I figured out when it was on, same time every week, and there's Gorilla Monsoon and the Valiant Brothers and Pedro Morales, and, you know, it was like, again, it was like Marvel superheroes, DC Comics, you know, superhero supervillains come to life, and I was a total mock. I thought it was all real, and, you know, it was just, amazing and finally my dad takes me to wrestling at Madison Square Garden and we had a black and white TV set and I walk into the garden and I'm like wow this is in color <laughs> yes <I'm laughs> like, it's in color and there's Killer Kowalski and, and all these you know amazing amazing you know athletes and uh, the first match I saw was Nikolai Volkov and Freddie Blassie against Bruno Sammartino and Chief J. Strongbow, June 24, 1974. I can remember the day. That's, you know, how important it was in my life. And I would never dream that years later, years later, Nikolai would be a friend, the Valiant Brothers would be friends. You know, it, life, life takes strange twists and turns. And... Um, that's basically it. I, I basically found wrestling by accident on the UHF dial. Who won the tag team match? Uh, Bruno and Strongbow, yeah. two out of three falls. Back then it was two out of three right. falls. But um, the the match that really stole the show were the Valiant Brothers against Dean Ho and Tony Gurria. And um, later, you know, I'm, I'm managing Johnny Valiant. He's sleeping on my couch. How wow. surreal this all is. How surreal. Yep. And, and I'm guessing by your age and by the sound of uh, a little bit of accent I'm picking up, you're familiar with WWOR Channel 9 out of Secaucus, New Jersey? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Saturdays at midnight. That's I right. watched that throughout, throughout my youth. And, uh, yep. And 
and is basically squash matches yeah. and an occasional, occasional tag title change. And it was just so much better <laughs> than Raw or SmackDown today, you know, which is stultifying for the most part with the scripted promos. And Johnny Valiant told me they would roll into a studio back in the day and they would just cut promos all day, all day. And basically they would just say, okay, Philadelphia Spectrum, August 1st, Valiant's against, uh, you know, Hohen Gurria. And, and they would just improv the whole thing, one after another after another, total improv. And today it's stilted, it's scripted, it's, it's awful, awful. We'll dive into more Raw and SmackDown because your very first post on Facebook this year is my screensaver now because I completely agree with everything you wrote. But I'm shocked that it took this long for John to tell you that he's also from Brooklyn, the, the whole WWOR reference, because he normally just wants to tell everybody he's from Brooklyn right off the bat, because that's the way he is. I wrote a book, Apartment 4B Like in Brooklyn, about growing up in East Flatbush in the 60s and 70s. So uh, <laughs> I could certainly relate to Brooklyn. Yeah. You're familiar with um, Gravesend, Sheepshead Bay? That was sort of my neighborhood. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, your post, uh, your very first post about Raw and SmackDown this year, uh, like I said, it's, it's my screensaver. It's amazing. Why do you think uh, wrestling has gotten so scripted that they can't talk anymore or cut a promo? What, what's your thoughts on that? It's a, it's a monster corporation, a billion dollar corporation. They don't want to offend. It's PG, um, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I sat up uh, two or two or three weekends ago watching Wrestle Kingdom all weekend, and I support indies, and I, I love AEW. You know, I'm not one of these. There's been no good wrestling since the territories. I just <laughs> find I just find WWE stultifying for the most part, and it's a shame because the irony is. WWE has one of the greatest talent bases in the history of this industry. And when you watch an NXT takeover, you realize how great it can be. But that's six times a year. Right. You know, most, most of the programming, you know, that ridiculous wedding or the fiend against Seth Rollins, it's like penance for sins I committed in previous lifetimes. Oh it's like a knife in my heart watching that stuff, you know? Right. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, let's talk about AEW a little bit then. Uh, upstart promotion. You know, they're doing great things. You see a lot of... Well, this week I saw a lot of Dusty in Cody. I know that it's a, maybe a backhanded compliment or whatever, but... His promo was an old NWA promo, and that's why I think old guys like us, being 42, um, enjoy AEW as much. Is, is that why you like it as well? I just like rooting for the underdog. When I watch boxing, I root for the underdog. When, I, you, know, when, I, when you have AEW supposedly versus WWE, and that's really the fanboys creating all this drama. Right. Because you know, nobody, nobody's going to be a threat to WWE. They're a billion-dollar corporation. They're going to keep chugging along no matter what. But um, I, I just I, I think Pentagon and Phoenix are the best tag team in the world. I think the Young Bucks are great. The old-school guys who go... You know, it's all flip flop, and you know, it's like these guys are great, great athletes. I, you know, some of the '70s guys. It's almost like nostalgia goggles. I mean, Ivan Putski is not Kenny Omega. Kenny Omega versus Okada is wrestling elevated to an art form. Okay, so the everything was better back then is nonsense too. AEW has a tremendous roster. Do I like all of it? No. Sometimes it gets silly also, and uh, I don't particularly care for, um, you know, four tag teams at the same time and eight-man match. That doesn't do much for me. But when you have Phoenix and uh, Pentagon against, like, Kenny Omega and Hangman Page or whatever, you know, this is as good as it gets. I mean, it, it's tremendous, tremendous wrestling, and... Uh, 
I, I just like supporting the underdog. Yeah, you, you're uh, you're singing our song. Um, we agree wholeheartedly with that sentiment. We have said that there's really no time like the present. Uh, is it all great? No. Um, and sometimes we remember things through rosy-colored glasses. That's not to say there wasn't great wrestling growing up. Obviously there was. But uh, we, we agree that there's really no time like the present. Um, I this is a golden age of wrestling right now. You could sit in your living room and watch New Japan World. You can You can watch wrestling literally from around the world, stream it. You, there's indies every weekend. You have choices. You, you could sit on YouTube and watch endless great wrestling if you chose to. You know, my, my goal in life isn't to watch wrestling 24-7. But at the same time, you have these amazing, these amazing promotions. And, uh, you know, these guys are doing things that some of the old school wrestlers couldn't have dreamed of. AJ Styles is an artist. He's an artist. Yes. Unfortunately, yeah. he's in the middle of a circus. <laughs> but he's an artist. And, and when you put him in the ring with the right guy and actually, AJ, you got 15, 20 minutes, go. You know, you're going to see art. You're going to see right. art. But uh, unfortunately, you know, I, I've sat at Madison Square Garden on occasion for WWE. And to, to get to those two, you know, very good or excellent matches, you have to sit through three hours of pablum. And you're kind of numb by the time you get to that good match. And, Too right. Touche. Yeah. But no, seriously. <clears throat> seriously. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, another raw question. Uh, Mark mentioned to you that uh, I love dropping names, dropping information, and I do. Uh, I had a director who would just tear into us during rehearsals saying, I can see you reading your lines, meaning like we're not in the moment. You know, I could see you going down the script. Right. I see you turning the page. I get that sense. Am I crazy? Am, am I seeing that on Raw? And if I am, whose fault is that? Are we asking too much of Seth Rollins to write all this for him and, and ask him to remember it all? Um, is it the writer's fault? Is it the performer's fault? Because I can almost see these guys and the girls going down their script trying to remember word for word. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I was just telling somebody the other day, um, I was watching three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri, and Frances McDormand won the Oscar for Best Actress. And, and I said to somebody, you forget she's acting. That's how great her performance is. You forget she's acting. And when you turn on WWE with the scripted, stilted, you know, promos, you could almost see the wheels turning in their head as they try to remember this nonsense that they're spewing, you know, this meaningless nonsense. And, you know, Cody Rhodes, when you put him on, you could see it's from the heart. You could see he's improving it. And, you know, he knows what he has to say. He knows what he has to put over the angle, the upcoming match, the upcoming pay-per-view, whatever. But it's improv, and it's real, and it's from the heart, and it's a huge difference. I mean, I, en I enjoy watching Chris Jericho just talk. In WWE, the only guy I could really say that is Kevin Owens. I think he, has, he seems to have a little more freedom, I, I, or, or else he's just a better actor because it doesn't sound as scripted when Kevin Owens is talking. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I don't know if you watch any NWA at all, but I get that with Aaron Stevens, too. Even if the comeback isn't as sharp or as witty, it's from his heart. It, it, he's got an idea of who he's playing. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I think the issue with NWA is you have this great atmosphere. You have these really good wrestlers. I'm just not seeing a lot of great, great wrestling. You know, you're seeing good and very good wrestling. There, there is a difference. Um, what, what happens with somebody my age is, you know, you're comparing very good wrestlers to great wrestlers. You know, I grew up on Terry Funk. You know, I grew up on prime Ric Flair, Don Morocco in his prime, etc. so on. And you go, okay, you know, this guy's good. This guy's very good, but he's not, you know, prime Ric Flair wrestling Ricky Steamboat. There is a difference. 
Oh, there's a huge difference. We completely agree with you. But I guess we're saying, like, the NWA now, uh, before we get into why we're really on the show to bring up 350 Days in the Wrestlers, um, NWA now is more of a, a retro for us, just to bring us back to the Terry Funk, the Ric Flair days, uh, reminisce about them, more, more or less. That's where we're going with NWA right now. Yeah, support them. I mean, it, you know, it's a quality product. Um, I, I just I just have a very bad reaction when I see the WWE fanboys attack other promotions, like us versus them. I mean, this is a billion-dollar corporation with a 50-year head start. I mean, why right. attack the little guys? Why attack the new guys? I, I don't get that mentality. You know, I hear people literally say, WWE is my religion. Vince is my hero. <laughs> I hear people say this, and I cringe, and I'm kind of like, dude, you got to get out of the house more. You got to start dating. Move out of my basement. <laughs> you know, something's not right here. You know, right. You you brought up one more question before we we uh, chug along. Um, you brought up indies as well. Do you uh, go to some indies around Brooklyn or anything? Is there any indie shows you want to... One, maybe we'll come up and cover because John would love to be coming back home. Or uh, is there not any... Only, not only do I go to indies, I get in the ring and do uh, a heel valet gimmick. Um, oh, Team wow. Splendid. Yeah, Team Splendid. Um, Chris Michaels was... Uh, in WWE, and Chris Michaels was also an ECW, very early ECW tag team champion when Eddie Gilbert was booking, and uh, he's and also um, simply splendid is yeah. Where where so it's almost like Gorgeous George. They have the flowing robe. Nice, and, you know. And I, and I get on the mic and I uh, rip on the guys with the uh, WWE belts and you know sitting in the audience. And it's a lot of fun, you know. It's a, we have a good time. Which, so uh, any any W is uh, one of the promotions that we work for. Titan out in New Jersey. I mean, you could literally go to an indie every weekend right. in New York and New Jersey. I mean, it, it, you know, it's countless. I would just bore the listeners throwing out letters. A B C D E F. <laughs> Five hundred indies, but. Uh, they're certainly out there. Go out and support. And this is what I tell the parents. I tell, it's funny. Um, my best friend, we took his nephew and all his little buddies to indie shows. Indie shows. I, we never took them to WWE because we knew they'd meet the wrestlers, get photographs, get autographs. You're right on top of the action for 15 20 bucks. You know, WWE, the last house show at the Garden, 36 to $206 a ticket. Can you imagine a mom and dad taking two kids at those prices, plus parking, food, gimmicks? Could you imagine what that evening cost a family of four? You know, take the kids to an indie show, enjoy, meet the wrestlers, support indie everything, support indie music, indie film, indie theater, you know, really. I mean, the monster corporations, you know, don't need you as much as these mom and pop operations. That's that's the best thing uh, I heard thus far this morning. We are actually in about three hours from now packing our boys up to go to an indie event here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. is That's what we do. Every month, the, it's called IWC. They put on a show. Pittsburgh's the same way. Every weekend, you can go to a show down here, and it's the kids love meeting the wrestlers. They're more family now than Seth Rollins will ever be. <laughs> yeah, Johnny Valiant was out of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh yeah. was always a big wrestling town. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Um... Okay, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, The Wrestler, um, which has been out now for about 11 or 12 years. I just have a few questions about that, but then I really want to dig into this documentary, which I watched, honest to God, like four or five times over the last few days, 350 days. Um, so your, your title was Associate Producer, correct? Yes. Basically, okay. what that means is I was the wrestling guy. I brought in... 125 or so different wrestlers for uh, five or six screen tests. Um, 
readings. Um, I brought in Necro Butcher. I brought in Ron Killings. I, I brought in uh, Ring of Honor. So Ring of, we shot at Ring of Honor, the climactic scene. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. Necro Butcher, <laughs> Necro Butcher was coming in to meet with Aronofsky, and he's really, really late. So all of a sudden, this you know notorious hardcore wrestler. His mother calls up to see if he's okay. Okay. Oh my God. His mother's, call, his mother's calling up. So finally, Necro Butcher shows up, and uh, the rest is history. And um, while shooting that crazy scene, you know, um, we had this we had this cinematographer from France, this sweet little woman, and she's in the middle. Of this like absolute carnage, and you, I'm like reading her face, like you know, she's trying to capture all of this chaos, and uh, it was an amazing experience to work on this. Uh, I'm sitting on set one day, just hanging out, that uh, very sad autograph scene, and um, I'll give you the I'll give you the backstory on that. I, I take Aronofsky. And the screenwriter and the executive producer, the money guy, Scott Franklin, to a convention, to an old school convention. And there's Captain Lou and uh, Johnny Valiant and Iron Sheik and Nikolai and Mae Young and Moolah, all these legends who are mostly gone now. And uh, there's nobody there. There's nobody there. It's it's like a graveyard. Oh. Iron Sheik's head is down on the table sleeping that's how bad it was it was grim oh. and the screenwriter the screenwriter actually goes back and adds it to the script it wasn't in the original script interesting so uh yeah so i'm on set and all of a sudden aronofsky gets the smirk and he goes evan come here I'm like yeah he goes i want you i want you to work the uh the, the various tables with the wrestlers and and those guys actually were actors except for um Johnny Valiant and Manny Yarborough, who was a famous sumo. He worked um, UFC early on. Um, but these were these were actors, except for those two guys. He says, go up to Mickey last and ask him for an autograph and a Polaroid. So, so Mickey walks over to me and whispers in my ear, just improv it. He thinks I'm an actor. I'm not an actor. Okay? <laughs> so... so so there's like 125 people on set, these giant cameras, and, and I do exactly what Aronofsky says, and I get up to Mickey, and, and I'm thinking, like, what would I say to this guy? Because I'm improv it. So I go, I loved you as a kid. I saw you at the garden. Can I have your autograph? And he goes, what's your name? <laughs> so again, I'm thinking, and I go, Evan. So it dawns on me how surreal this is. I'm playing myself in a fictional movie, okay? So, um, so <laughs> I'll fast forward ahead. We're at the New York Film Festival, Lincoln Center, totally sold out, 2,300 people, 40 bucks a ticket. And I'm sitting with my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, and well, I don't know if I made the final cut. I'm watching the movie like everybody else. And all of a sudden, I come on the screen, and my girlfriend looks at me, looks at the screen, looks at me, look at the screen, and she goes, that's you. You know, that's you. I go, yeah, yeah. The whole experience was like magic. Am I allowed to curse on here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we're at the rap, the rap party to wrap up the whole production. It's all shot. It's all done in the can. And um, Aronofsky's making a speech, and he says, I'll never forget it as long as I live. He goes, I don't know what the fuck we have, but we have something. I'll never forget it. Those were his exact <laughs> words. Like, he just knew he had captured something special. And uh, anybody that understands film knows a film is also made in the editing room, of course. But... Uh, you know, um, it, it was it was a beautiful experience, and um, I tell people all the time, you know, Mickey Rock's performance, when he says, I'm just a broken down piece of meat, that's like Marlon Brando in, 
and on the waterfront, I could have been a contender. Absolutely, yeah. it's, an, it's an iconic performance. A hundred years from now, people will watch that movie. Yeah. And there are greater movies, believe me. I, I, there are greater movies. But I don't think there's a lot of greater performances than what Mickey did in that movie. It's a shame he didn't win the Oscar that year. He did He did win the Golden Globe that year for that. He did, yep. Yeah. yeah. W- was this supposed to be, I heard a rumor that it was supposed to be a Von Erich film. Is there any truth to that? That that was the original idea for the rest of no, 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 no. Okay. no. There's all kinds of rumors, and, uh, you know, it wasn't based on any one guy. Um, uh, Mickey spent a lot of time with Greg Valentine. You know, Mickey, re- I took Aronofsky and them every weekend to indie shows, every weekend, we were backstage for CZW, Cage of Death. Oh, my God. It was like God. a mass unit. Oh it was like God. a mass unit. These guys are all covered in blood. So, so, so I go to Mickey, what did you think of that? He goes, it was fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey's a tough guy. You know, Mickey, Mickey loves this stuff, you know? But um, he, uh, he was in his early 50s at the time. And he had never wrestled, obviously, but he had boxed, and he was an athlete and a legit tough guy. And we spent a weekend with Nicolas Cage. This is, this is a true story. Not a lot of people know this. Um, we couldn't get the funding we needed with Mickey. His name wasn't as big at that point. We, we wanted $18 million to do this movie. We ended up with $6 million. Six million is like the Avengers, you know, food budget. You understand? <laughs> right, yeah. Understand? Yeah, yeah. So um, we meet with Nicolas Cage. And people don't realize this. At the time, you know, the guy's like in great shape. He looks good, you know. And Mickey looked the part. Mickey looked the part. And I'm sitting with Aronofsky, and Aronofsky's like, I, I, I got to go with my heart. Mickey's, Mickey's the right guy for this, even though Nicolas Cage at the time was bigger box office. And the movie brought in $36 million domestic, and, you know, it was a success. It was a critical success. It was a financial success. Again, it wasn't the Avengers or Spider-Man or Wonder Woman, but, you know, we're proud of the film. We're just proud of it. For a wrestling fan, though, uh, Evan, I think it is Spider-Man or the Avengers or anything like that because this this movie just shows us, fans, wrestlers, what they do for us, and it, it's unbelievable. Yeah, well, let me let me just say, let me just say something. Um, there were there were critics of the film because they thought it painted a grim picture, you know, trailer park, you know, yada yada, but. Um, I know guys, and I won't even name names, I know guys who sold out Madison Square Garden in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, early 80s, never broke 100 grand. They ended up pushing a broom or a bouncer at a club. You know, I mean, again, for the zillionth time, it's disgraceful that McMahon doesn't give these guys pensions, 401ks, health benefits. Absolutely disgraceful. But, um, so... You know, imagine you're headlining Madison Square Garden, you're wrestling in Japan, you're wrestling in, the, on, in Australia, around the world, you're a star around the world, and one day you wake up and you're pushing a broom, okay? Not that there's anything wrong with hard day's honest work, but I'm just saying, the, the, you know, the bubble has burst after the glory, after the glory, and... Um, you know, so this does happen. A lot of these guys do not end up well. Some do, you know. <laughs> there are guys who are financially okay, but many don't. And that's what we were showing in that movie. And, um, you know, w- w- some some people in the industry w- were offended, and others felt, hey, we captured it. You know, uh, we certainly weren't doing a hatchet job. We... All of us love wrestling. You know, we, we wanted to honor it, and um, hopefully that's what we did. Uh, for sure. No, I, I would uh, wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, I loved it. Two more quick questions about it. Um, a, you say Mickey Rourke looked the part. Uh, super charismatic oh, yeah. guy, long blonde hair, tan, uh, beats a Middle Eastern villain for the World Heavyweight Championship in the 80s. 
Um, was there any outside influence on, on this character and some of the characters that appeared in this movie? Well, um, the producers and, and Aronofsky himself were mid-80s wrestling fans. So, you know, they're thinking Iron Sheik, right. you know? Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and unfortunately, he's, he's not in good physical shape and really wasn't in good physical shape even back then. So I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but Johnny Rods played a character called Java Rook, and Absolutely. he would main event. In, yeah, he would main event in L.A. So I go down to Gleason's gym, and I say, Johnny, you'd be perfect for this. You'd be perfect for this. And and I said, would you like to come down and and read for Aronofsky? He goes, I'm in this business for 30 years, 40 years, whatever, and I, I don't need to read for anybody. I'm like, Johnny, this is, a, this, is a world, this is a world-class director, a world-class director. You know, please, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity. He, he, he refused to do it. He refused to do it. And, um, you know, so uh, it's, it could have played out differently. Um, I told Aronofsky to bring in Nigel McGuinness. Nigel McGuinness wow. at the time wow. yeah, was on top, not to, play, not to play that character, just to be in the movie. Um, we had a scene um, where Romeo Roselli was wrestling Ron Killings briefly, and this was shot in Jersey. And um, I said, Nigel McGuinness is as great as anybody on the planet right now. But um, what I learned from this movie was um, a lot of times you're, you're basing your choices on aesthetics. Who looks the best? Who, uh, ma many times I recommended people, and Aronofsky was, he's too big. He's going to make Mickey look small. We don't, and then what I kept saying to Aronofsky for that autograph scene, I said, let me bring in... Jimmy Valiant and John, and you know all the old school guys, Captain Lou. Let me bring in all those guys for that autograph scene. And he's debating, 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 and finally goes, "I don't want to do it. Mickey's going to look like what's wrong with this picture. He's going to look like the odd man out." So um, we ended up with actors and um, the only legit wrestlers, like I said before, with Johnny Valiant and Manny Yarborough, who was a sumo. Uh, I'm still stunned over Johnny Rods. Brando read for Coppola, but uh, yeah. apparently yeah. Johnny Rods doesn't read. Holy cow! All right. Well, he's not an he's not an actor. <laughs> he's not he's an looking actor. at it from a wrestler's point of view. Uh, you know? Okay, no, I see, I see. All right. Uh, yeah. Rumor has it uh, Roddy Piper, maybe some other guys went up to Mickey, hugged him. Uh, some guys thanked oh, yeah. him for for. Yeah. yeah putting this together did you experience that did you did you see this happening i wasn't i wasn't at that particular function um i was at various film festivals with them but i was not at that particular one but i believe i saw it on youtube after the fact and piper said many many times how moved he was by this movie that he cried that um he felt that it really captured um his life is you know his experience and uh it's um it's a powerful it's a powerful film and you know it could have been a boxer it could have been a uh football player you know it could have it, it could have this is not unusual somebody's a star and then 20 years later they're hanging by a thread they're, they're mm -hmm. not you know making it anymore and you know, when you, I, I was just telling somebody the other day, uh, I've been to literally hundreds of conventions around the world, wrestling, horror, sci-fi, comics, you know, and what you see eventually, what you see is wrestlers sitting next to boxers, sitting next to rockers, sitting next to porn queens, sitting next to whomever, and they're all there because they need the money for the most part for the most part they need the money it's not glamorous it's not glamorous right you know to run to run from hotel to hotel city to city to hawk your autograph these guys really want to perform they want to be on a stage they want to be in a ring so what happens 
after the glory. And if people really understood even the exploitative nature of the autograph industry, a lot of these guys aren't even making thousands of dollars. They're making a couple of hundred bucks to sign their autograph. You know, you follow? It's, yeah, it's not yeah. that It's not that glamorous, believe me. Uh, you know, they they like that the fans remember them. They like seeing the boys. They like seeing their old friends. I mean, there's a good side to it. I don't want to paint just a grim picture, but... Um, I have I have a love hate relationship with pro wrestling. I've I've lost many many friends in this business. My buddy Tiger Khan was one of my closest friends. He worked for the Hearts up in Calgary. I get a phone call. He's dead, 33 oh. years old. And why? Because he was a regular sized guy, and he you know the uh, quote unquote wrestling lifestyle, you know drugs, alcohol, steroids. And one day, you have a heart attack and you don't wake up, and that's that's that. And I, you know, I was on the road with this guy up and down those highways, New York to Pennsylvania. You know, Evan, when I make it in WWE, we're gonna have a blast. We're gonna, you know, and and then the dreams die. Yeah. So, you know, I I have a love hate relationship with this business. Believe me, I. I I, I like I said earlier, I was Johnny Valiant's manager for a time, and I book him for this spot. You know this indie show in New Jersey. He's wrestling Jimmy Snooker. They're, they're they're not kids anymore, okay? The place is packed. They're in the main event. They put on as good a match as they're capable of. Which you know these guys they forgot more than a lot of the kids know. Believe me, right. these guys twenty years ago were capable of putting on a quality match. Okay, so the punchline to the story, you know, they're, they're, they're paying him 350 bucks to wrestle, and uh, the promoter's like, uh, Evan, Johnny, you know, we didn't have a great house tonight, and, uh, you know, would you, would, you, would you take this? And they hand us less than what they promised us. And I'm like, listen, the place is packed. Give us what you told us you're going to give us. Come on, come on. You know, it's... Um, there's an ugly side to this business. There's an exploitative side to this business. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't want to bum out all your listeners. No, no, that's all right, but it's, it's <laughs> true. The it, other side, the other side is, my, my buddy Lanny Papa will say, I saw the world on somebody else's dime. Right. They, they took me around the globe, the promoters. You know, they they Johnny Valiant wrestled for oil sheiks three in the morning, three in the morning in Saudi Arabia. He looks out at the crowd. He looks out at the crowd. There's not a woman in the audience. How surreal this is. Wow. How surreal this Unbelievable. is. Unbelievable. You know, these guys, these guys saw the world, believe me, and had, you know, unbelievable experiences. And, um, you know, there's a plus and minus to everything. For sure. Uh, one other quick note on the wrestler before we move on to 350 days. If you're wondering about my range, Evan, uh, I could probably have played the guy in the grocery store that recognizes Randy the Ram Robinson behind the deli counter. I was so, there the day they shot that. Yeah. That's a powerful scene. That's also. a great scene. Yeah, yeah it really yeah. is. Yeah, it really yeah. is. All right, because Evan, his head is getting bigger by the moment. Uh, let's transition over to 350 days. Uh, uh, an amazing documentary, and some of the stuff that we all took out of it we'll get into, but one of the very first things, I watched it first, and I didn't know this, uh, the Bret Hart saying, yeah, I, I did some steroids a couple times, blew my mind. This, this is the one thing, and I know that's probably, I shouldn't pull that out, but I... Bret Hart, you know, the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever was, will be excellence of execution. Never thought anything about steroids, and he releases it on 350, and I'm like, holy shit. I, I, <laughs> unbelievable. What about, what about the line when he says, uh, when you sit, when, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly, but I'll paraphrase. 
when you sit in, when you sit in a room with a bunch of guys doing coke, you really get to know them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's not it's not an endorsement. It's not an endorsement of drugs. He's, he's just being honest. And right. uh, I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you the backstory on this movie. Um, another Darren, Darren Antola, was a. Uh, or is a boxing cut man. He travels all around the world with uh, top-notch fighters, and he loves wrestling, and he goes back also to the mid-'80s, and he got this idea. Let's capture <laughs> what, what a insane sex, drugs, rock and roll lifestyle being on the road 350 days is. And if you think the number's an exaggeration, guys like Ric Flair wrestled 350 nights a year so greg valentine who's a buddy of mine he stays he stays by me he says that at his his peak he would estimate he wrestled 320 days a year so this number is is right right there right there 320 days a year greg valentine wrestled at his peak okay so what what does that do to your mind body psyche family children you're not home for christmas why you're wrestling starcade you're not home for thanksgiving why you're wrestling at the survivor series you're not home for the kids birth you're not home for the kids marriage you're not home for the kids graduation what does this do to your relationship so the wrestlers will tell me seriously quote quote unquote evan I'm always in pain. I'm always in pain. They hate the word fake. They go, my hip replacement wasn't fake. My knee replacement wasn't fake. My three divorces weren't fake. My kid not talking to me isn't fake. Okay? And that's what we wanted to capture. So we have a meeting with uh, the editor, Michael Burlingame. First time I meet him. He worked with Paul McCartney, Mariah Carey, John Cougar Mellencamp, Sting, the singer, not the wrestler, from the police. And he knows nothing about wrestling. And I said to the producer, I said, this guy's perfect. He's perfect. This guy's, gonna, this guy's going to hone the best material, the most poignant, the most powerful. Because he, he doesn't know the main event guys from the mid-card guys, from the quote-unquote job is, I don't like the term, but that's, how, how most people recognize it. He doesn't know one from the other. He's going to he's going to pick up. We had ninety hours of footage. Ninety. Oh hours. my God. Which he, yeah, which he honed into an hour forty eight. Okay, and I said to him, I said to him, Mike, this is the movie I want you to make. I said, imagine an eighty year old woman who never watched wrestling make this woman cry. That's what I want you to make. This is not a shoot interview. This is not who was the booker in Chattanooga in 1972. We've had enough of that. That's not what this is. I said, make people understand what was it like to be on the road and sacrifice mightily for the fans to be away from their families, to always be in pain. And to be in pain and wrestle anyway because, because you're scared of losing your spot. It's a brutal business. And I said, capture all of this. Capture all of this. And he did. He did. And I, I, I just said, the world doesn't need another shoot interview. It really doesn't. And if you, if you go on Amazon, it's very interesting. There's about 100 reviews. About 80 of them are glowing, four stars, five stars. Then you have like the one star <laughs> reviews, you know, like, like a fraction as many, a minuscule amount. They just didn't get it. They go, I knew a lot of this information already. It's not about yeah. information. It's about these guys pouring their hearts out, saying how guilty they are for committing adultery, how guilty they are for not being there for their kids, you know, this is a this is from the heart. This movie, just like the wrestler, this is from the heart. And you know, if if you don't appreciate something like that, you know, watch another shoot interview. You know, but that's not what we were trying to do here. 
George the Animal Steel said something very interesting, and I've often thought this, you know, the pulling the curtain back, um, looking into their lives, George the Animal Steel said the fans don't want to know what a drag this is. Um, and, and, and I kind of understand that. Did you gain a different perspective from this? Did this ruin anything for you? You know, I, I can't go back now and watch WrestleMania 8, Money Incorporated, against the natural disasters and not think, geez, Ted DiBiase maybe just got off the phone with his wife and she wants to talk to him when he gets home. How the hell is he concentrating on this match? Um, <laughs> did, did you get a different perspective uh, after this? Did it ruin anything for you? Um, a lot of these guys were personal friends even before because I, I, I was acting as an agent and booking various guys and on the road with various guys. So I, I, I basically knew the horror stories in advance, but, um, you know, it, it's very, it, it's very painful to have a, a camera pointed at you and basically say, I wasn't a good husband. I, I wasn't the dad I wanted to be. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't there for these people who, who stood by me while I was away. And I, I, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very mixed bag. If you watch the movie, a lot of them say I would do it all over again. I, I saw the world. I had great experiences. I performed in front of vast crowds, including WrestleMania, you know, um, I entertained millions. I followed my muse. I followed my dream. There's a good and bad side to everything, including their lifestyles. But the point is, it, it's very extreme. Extreme. You're wrestling in front of 100,000, excuse me, 93,000 people or whatnot <laughs> at WrestleMania 3. At WrestleMania 3, the next thing you know, you're wrestling in front of 93 people at, at, at a high school gym somewhere, you know, because you're not who you were 10 years before. And, um, you know, it's, it's – all I could say is the film is from the heart, and these guys poured their guts out. And, you know, we're very proud of it. And it's a true indie film. There, there's no billion-dollar corporation behind it. There's no huge – promotional budget so we appreciate guys like you getting behind it and uh spreading the word and basically this movie's bread and butter is good good word of mouth which we've had we've had nothing but good word of mouth well it's, good, a, yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing great, yeah. yeah it's it's very very good so spreading the word is is an easy job for us because we thoroughly enjoyed it um on that absolutely on that note uh as far as you know pouring their guts out in the honesty uh, I met Bruno Sammartino a couple times about 20 years ago, and both times he just outright lied to me, and I found out years later I got kayfabe by Bruno Sammartino. Mark and I feel like to a certain extent, you know, we don't know everything. Of course we don't know everything. No. Some of these guys still hide certain things. Were you surprised by the level of honesty um, that they showed you guys during the shooting of this film? Um, yes and no. Uh, no with the guys we were friends with already. I mean, like I said, Greg Valentine's a friend, and um, you know, Tito Santana we worked with uh, quite often, and uh, you know, J.J. Dillon we had you know, some kind of relationship with. But when you walk in and you're talking to strangers, you know, that's a, that's a different scenario. And I think they saw, they sensed that director Fulvio Cesare that produces Darren Antola and David Wilkins, I think they just sensed that, you know, these guys were passionate about wrestling, passionate about the movie, passionate about doing it right. It wasn't a hatchet job. You know, these, these guys are very street smart. They've dealt with kings and queens and, and the scum of the earth as well. Some of the scum of the earth are promoters. Right. Okay. So, so you know, I think they just sensed that this was not some kind of expose hatchet job, you know. Uh, so I think that, that relaxed them and, you know, they opened up. Right. And, um, and, and, you know, inevitably while you're setting up the cameras and all of that, you know, you, you you start talking, you know, just just as 
people and um I did a promotional interview with JJ J. Dillon on behalf of the movie and uh I'm like JJ uh you know those NWA shows in Philly in the um mid to late 80s I said that was the greatest wrestling I ever saw I'm I'm being honest I've been going since 74 I said those nights you know you had the horsemen on top then then you had the road warriors midnight express rock and roll express the talent was so it was so unbelievable. You had guys like Billy Graham and Jimmy Valiant mid card, mid card. Yeah, right. you know guys who used to, guys who used to headline the Garden. I mean, the talent was unbelievable, and the shows were unbelievable. I said to JJ, I mean sincerely, I said those were some of the best nights of my life being at those shows. And you know, when you talk like this, and and you're you're pouring your heart, and the thing that people really don't express is inevitably when you talk about going to wrestling as a kid as a teenager you were with your father you were with your grandfather you were with your uncle grandmother mother whoever and a lot of them are gone now they're gone now and you look at it you look at it as those were some of the best nights of my life my dad took me there my grandfather took me there my uncle aunt whomever you know, I don't want to make it male, female. It could be anybody. And um, and you look back, and th- these nights had meaning to you beyond the wrestling, beyond the wrestling. And, um, you know, I, I, I've i made an effort to, you know, take my, be- my best, like I said before, my best friend's... Um, my best friend's nephew. We've taken him and the kids to tons of wrestling, and I'm hoping one day when I'm gone, they'll look at this as wow, you know, Evan and uh, you know they they took us to some you know great great stuff. We took them to tons of Ring of Honor shows instead of WWE, you know. <laughs> yeah, so they saw some great wrestling. Yeah, right? they did. If you took them to Ring of Honor, you, they definitely saw some great wrestling. I'm talking. I'm talking Brian Danielson, not yeah. Daniel Bryan. Right. Talking, yeah, that's I'm talking, yeah. Some great wrestling. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys, as you said, were very forthcoming with information. Uh, Marty Jannetty held back a little bit. Party Marty was talking about partying back in the days with his tag team partner, and he wouldn't, in his words, he wouldn't mention Sean by name. Um, do you have any idea whom he meant? Who he meant? Yeah, he says he wouldn't mention Sean by name. It's, I, I'm just messing. Yeah, with well, you. I'm yeah. assuming he's. I'm assuming right. he's talking about Sean. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That was my I, attempt uh, at humor, Evan. I, I I don't think he was holding back. I think right. that's him. You know, right. even today at age sixty, I think that's him. That's Potty Marty. I, yeah, I, I don't think he was in character. The, the, you know, I, I don't think he's ever quite changed from from what I've seen. You know. No, uh, we ran into him a couple years ago at the big event in New York City, and he was definitely party Marty that night. Let me tell you, I happen to like him. I, I think he's a good-hearted guy, and um, you know, very, very sociable. Very. Oh yeah, we me, yeah we do too. He was, yeah. he was he was he was a great time for sure. Uh, you brought up that you had ninety hours uh, of film. How long did it take to make this documentary? I, I know it's years, but I mean, are we talking like ten years? I mean, this has been in the works for six years. Six. six years, and the wrestler, the wrestler, from beginning to end was seven years. Wow. People have no idea. No, I, I'm not talking filming. The filming yeah, of the wrestler sure. was uh, thirty-five days, seven five-day weeks. But you're talking five or six script revisions. And getting the funding, you know, meeting after meeting, trying to get the money for this. And um, same thing with 350 Days. You know, you, you have to finance it. Every photo, every piece of music, every video clip, there's legalities. There, there's contracts. There's payments. There's, you know, the business end of a movie is very, very complex. Even distribution is complex. It's almost like a pie chart. Everybody gets a piece. You know, it's not just the filmmakers. You know, the, 
believe me, you're not going to get wealthy doing documentaries. You do documentaries because you believe in something and you have a passion for it and you need to tell that story. I tell anybody that wants to do a documentary, you know, understand you're going to spend an awful lot of time, blood, sweat, tears, and you're not going to get wealthy from this. Evan, is there a reason, and I'm going to answer my own question with this question, I know. Uh, is there a reason why only on Amazon? I mean, is there, is there ever going to be a copy of this that I can have in my house? You know, or... Oh, yeah, it's, it's available on DVD and Blu-ray. No problem. Oh, oh. Just, go, just go to, to 350daysthemovie.com, and uh, everything is up there. And that's the number, 350, 350daysthemovie.com. And, uh, yeah, we, it's, uh, it's out on Blu-ray and DVD. It's on Amazon. It's on, you can watch it free on Amazon Prime. You can watch it free on Tubi. You can rent it or buy it on any major cable system. You can buy it on YouTube. I mean, it, it has worldwide distribution. That we're pleased with. I mean, a lot right. of movies n never get that. So, um you know, it's not hard to find, and there's a Facebook page. Um, I mean, it, just just if you Google it, it'll, it'll come up easy enough. Some of these stories we heard, um, wrestlers getting burned with uh, cigarettes, cigars, getting quarters thrown at them, oh, yeah. uh, bodily fluids, Billy Graham's car looked like uh, Ryu got done kicking it in Street Fighter 2. Um, I, I, I get a little unreasonable maybe when I see a Red Sox hat, but w what is it about wrestling? As someone, Evan, who sort of works with, uh, uh, you know, creating sort of a, a piece of art about the human condition, what is it about this particular form of entertainment that just brings out some of the real ugly in fans? Well, let me just say something. Um <laughs> I started watching in 72, attending in 74, as I said earlier, and this was pre-internet. This was during the kayfabe era, and, you know, it was very vague <laughs> as a teenager, at least. You're sitting there, and you're going, well, that punch or kick didn't quite look like it landed, and the guy sold it like he was hit by a brick, but at the same time, you wanted to believe and many of the fans in that audience did believe. And back in the day, Nikolai, who was a dear friend, he said to me, they had to send him and the Sheik out hidden in an ambulance in the middle of the show because they had so much heat, they couldn't walk out at the end of the show and, with, with the mob of fans outside. They actually, at Madison Square Garden, they would hide them in an ambulance and drive them out of the arena. So, there, not all of this is in 350 days, but I could tell you stories. They, a fan threw acid in Blassie's face. Oh, my uh, God. I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he lost vision in part of his eye, in one eye. And um, uh, Piper was stabbed, Mulligan was stabbed, Moore was stabbed back in the day. You know, uh, Mulligan, Mulligan was slashed very badly, and... Uh, you know, Johnny Valiant told me a story. He's up in Canada. The Valiant brothers started a riot. The fans were literally stomping him, stomping him. And Butcher Vashon, who was a huge burly guy, he's in, he's in 350 days also, he ran out and saved his life, okay? So those fans believed back then. This is, this is what people don't grasp th today. Vince McMahon publicly said it's a work publicly back in the late 80s. So it's not exactly a secret. What I, thought, what I tell people today is I don't think there's 10 guys that get legit heel heat. Lesnar does. Chiampa does. Okay. MJF seems to. Okay. But there's not a lot of guys that get legit heel heat. But back then, you, you had these unbelievable villains and the fans thought it was real. 
So they're like, he's killing my my hero. You know? Yeah. And 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 they'd run into the ring with, with a with with a knife or whatever. You know, they weren't. You know, it was a different era, a different time. And um, you know, even myself, I started out as a sheet writer. You know, we didn't even have the internet late seventies, early eighties. You know, and um, we would. We, it was exciting to find results from another territory, and you didn't know that every night of the week, you know, these two guys were married and having, you know, the same match every night because you didn't have the internet with the results. It was a different. It was a different world back then. Uh, it sure was. You you mentioned in the documentary also uh, you talk about Gorgeous George, which now goes back maybe you know three four decades before what we were just discussing. And you see him maybe combing his hair, and the ref goes to check his tights, and he says, his line, get your filthy hands off me. And you see a sophisticated crowd in suits, and they all laugh. At, at some level, did we always know what we were watching was entertainment, that it was a work? How did we go from that to, you know, three or four years or decades later, someone getting acid thrown in their eyes? <laughs> well, there was always this, suspension of disbelief. It's like when you're watching a movie. You know the guy's not shooting the guy. They're actors, you know? There was a suspension of disbelief. But at the same time, like I said, um, a lot of fans believed. They believed. As a kid, I believed. Absolutely. I'll so tell you me. what happened. I'll tell you what happened. Guy says to me, older kid, he goes, um, Billy Graham's going to beat Bruno for the title in Baltimore. I think it was April 30, 1977. Okay? So, so April 30, 1977 comes, and Billy Graham beats Bruno in Baltimore. <laughs> and I'm like, it's like, it's like the bubble burst. I'm like, oh, man, this isn't real. This isn't real. You know? So, but then I, I kept going, and I just looked at it differently. This right. is an art. This is, you know, it's an art. It's magic what these guys are doing. And a movie's not real, and a TV show's not real. What's the difference? Right, right. You know? Yeah, for me it was when um, Rick Rude picked Cheryl Roberts to kiss, and my uncle said, John, uh, out of all the women in the uh, audience, he goes and picks that other wrestler's wife. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. what are the odds of that? Yeah. <laughs> So, Evan, that's that's pretty much 350 days, but what else are you, uh, do you have anything else going on right now? What else can you tell us that you have in the, in the bubble, I guess, huh? Uh, you could go to Facebook. I have Evan Ginsberg's Old School Wrestling Memories page, and uh, this is not one of those, there's been no good wrestling since the territories. This, it, that's not what we do. It's like very knowledgeable old school fans, you know, talking about, you know, just again, great memories and great experiences. And, um, you know, some of my closest friends in the world I met through wrestling. And then there's guys I wouldn't piss on if they were on fire. <laughs> you know, that's the wrestling business. That's the wrestling business, you know? And, um,. I, uh, just like the guys in the movie, I can't, I can't say I regret a lot, but, um, there's, there's a lot of obsessives, there's a lot of, uh, negativity, and, um, I, I just think, I just think the whole industry would be better off if these, uh, these guys got pensions and 401ks and health benefits. I think they more than deserve it. And um, I just think it's a shame that a lot of these guys do not end up well. And I know lots of indie guys who have never made it, but they have 16 concussions. They have terrible injuries. They've loved and sacrificed for the business without the fame and the payoff. So I, I just think somehow th then more needs to be done for these guys. And it's no different in boxing. The boxes don't end up well either. So um, it is pretty mind blowing. Um, Maybe we don't understand yeah. the numbers. I don't know, but you know that Mark and I are a couple of nine to five ham and eggers, and we have those things. Right. You know, we have retirement plans. We have health care, um, and these guys that are in a billion dollar corporation can't get that. It, yeah. Again, maybe we don't know the numbers, but it, it is mind blowing. 
Well, you're one you're one wrong move away from a career ending industry injury, career ending injury and look at draws. Look at you know right. there, there there have been people that died in the ring, died in the ring. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you even even as a valet, I'm backstage, we get ready to go into the ring. And these guys, uh, you know, be safe, be safe, you know. And and there's, there's, there's tension because anything can happen. Greg Valentine walked into a ring. The ring steps were old and shot, and the ring steps broke, and he, and he tore up his knee. Wow. Tore up his knee. And, and, and he, he's like, I rarely got hurt in the ring. I got hurt walking, walking up the steps, you know. And... Uh, in my situation, you know, I am not trained. I tell, and I'm not, I'm not particularly young, so I tell the promoter, make sure you guys know, don't put their hands on me. I'm just going out there to talk, you know. It's like, don't put your hands on me. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's dangerous, and these guys deserve, deserve benefits. Now, you mentioned the word tension. Uh, I'm not trying to be funny here at all. Mark has been a ring announcer for a local wrestling promotion, and he obviously couldn't sit with me that night. Uh, he, did, he did a great job. But when he would come out uh, at the end of the night, he was a changed man, and he talked about tension in the back. You know, uh, there's a lot that goes into it that, that we don't know that we'll never know. Oh, yeah. I mean, basically, they'll huddle and put a match together, you know, two teams or whatnot, or, you know, and uh, there's a lot to remember, and, you know, this is the finish, and, you know, and the referees in the huddle, and, you know, there's a lot of mechanics to putting together a 10, 12, 15-minute match that people don't realize, and, again, you want to do it safely and come out in one piece. And uh, I was on I was on an indie show once. Guy hits the guy with the chair in the head, and the second I heard it, I knew it was wrong. And the guy's head was split open. Jeez. The guy's head was split open. Yep. The guy the guy needed like eighteen staples in his head. Oh my God. And you know, and th that's for a fifty dollar indie payday. You, you follow? Yeah, it's, yeah, oh yeah. It's it, it's uh it's a rough business. And only a small percentage will make it. And I think it's great today that there's more opportunities. You have a lot more. It's it's not a one horse town anymore with WWE. There's tons of work. But but if you really understand this business, a lot of these smaller groups are not spreading the money around. Believe me. Believe me. The guy, the, the, you know. You think of somebody as a as a big deal, but the wrestlers are not making a lot of money right. in, in most scenarios. You, know, you can make good money in New Japan. You can make good money in WWE or AEW if, if you're on top. At the bottom in WWE, there are New York City school teachers making more money than some of these guys. Wow. You know, uh, yeah, there's, 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 there's guys on, on primetime TV making 57000 a year. Okay. So you're saying, as, as a nine to five, I'd like to make fifty-seven thousand a year, <laughs> but that's not a lot of money when you're on the road and you're sending money back to your family. Right, it's right. Minuscule. Right. Okay. And, and and I get my pet peeve with wrestling. I get so tired of the fanboys. They know what they're getting into, and they all piss away fortunes on wine, women, and song. I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. One. These guys didn't make fortunes to begin with. Two, they didn't all piss it away. Some do, many don't. And three, they were never paid what they deserved to begin with in most scenarios. It's a little different if you're, you know, the, the, the top of the WWE pyramid, but what if you're at the bottom of that pyramid? What, you know, do, do you really think guys on NWA Power and other promotions are making big money? They're not. Oh, no. They're no not. way. They're just not. And, um, you know, you, it's a dream, you know. Kevin Owens, I, I, you know, I, I saw in, um, 
you know, little tiny buildings, and now he's headlining Madison Square Garden. But that's the exception. That's not the rule. That's the exception. Right. Uh, we've had uh, some guys on the show before. You know, you'd mentioned earlier your story. Hey, look, we didn't make what we thought we made, and you're turning around and looking at the crowd, saying, "Come on, uh, who are you kidding here?" Uh, but we've heard stories of just basically promoters skimming off the top and then, um, you know, kind of like your situation, saying, hey, look, uh, this is what the payout is. It's disappointing to hear. It's just really disappointing to hear almost how commonplace this sort of thing was and maybe still I mean, is. I, I don't know. Um, well, there's the old expression, you know, you know, uh, a hot two hot dogs and a handshake or whatever. Right. You know, a lot of these indie guys, that's what they're getting paid, two hot dogs and a handshake. And uh, you did a great job, kid. And meanwhile, the kid, kid doing all kinds of high spots, risking his life you know, for two hot dogs and a handshake. And um, I think what these kids have to learn is don't put yourself at risk and learn how to tell a story. And it's not 37 high spots because that's not what a WWE or whomever is looking for. They're looking for guys who can work a match and tell a story. You know, not, it's, um, I have no problem with the Young Bucks and Super Kicks. I, you know, I enjoy these guys. Um, but at the same time, sometimes less is more. That's what the old school guys will tell you. Less is more. You know, you work the crowd, you you get the ref involved, foreign object, whatever. You don't have to do endless, endless moves, especially if nobody's selling. It becomes a meaningless blur. I could tell you results from 1974, and sometimes I couldn't tell you what happened at the Elks Lodge last weekend because it's like a meaningless <laughs> blur. No, seriously. No, no, that's, I'm, not I'm, that's not Alzheimer's. That's just... You know, the, the the stuff becomes meaningless after a while. Yeah. So on that note, um, just two more quick questions. Um, Brett the Hitman Hart uh, in your documentary is a self-described train wreck because of how hard he worked. And his, his matches were just, they were pretty. They were very pretty. His pile oh, he driver, great. he was great. Uh, he's my all-time favorite wrestler, and it's not even close. His pile driver looked absolutely devastating, and he claims to have never hurt anybody. We met Hillbilly Jim, who was an absolute sweetheart, and said, I didn't do any of that. I have my health. I have my, my faculties. Who did it right, uh, in your opinion? Because you remember more Bret Hart matches than you do Hillbilly Jim matches, don't you? Um, I always come from create art. Right. Create art. And uh, Bret Hart created art. And Hillbilly Jim was colorful, likable. He's, he's, my experiences with him, he's a, he's a great guy and down to earth. And I can't say a bad word about Hillbilly Jim, but I can't say a great word about Hillbilly Jim matches. Right. And I can say that about Bret Hart. And a hundred years from now, I think people will watch Bret Hart matches and they may not watch Hillbilly Jim matches. And I, I just think art stands the test of time. Um, I'm middle-aged. I'm sitting here watching the top 100 movies of all time. And um, last night I watched Truffaut's Shoot the Piano Player. I, I'm, I, just think it's, I just think art will always survive. And, and so uh, the, answer to you, the long-winded answer to your question is I go with Bret Hart. Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan was once quoted. He goes, so what? I broke my ankle. It's preserved on film for all time. <laughs> that's what he said. Yeah. No, that, I'm, that's a quote. That's a quote. And you can watch Drunken Master, Drunken Master 2, Police Story, whatever it is, Jackie Chan Prime, 1980s. And that stuff will be watched 100 years from now. I've seen it in museums. Museums. I was watching uh, at MoMA, Museum of Modern Art. Bruce Lee entered a dragon at MoMA, okay? Stuff that people thought was schlock 50 years ago is considered art now. Right. And, you know, if somebody said to me, Evan, let's churn something out. Here's a quick payday. 
I go, no, I'd rather spend six years and create something like 350 Days or The Wrestler. And uh, <laughs> that's why WWE is like a knife in my heart. When you see this incredible talent base with unlimited money behind it, and you're just sitting there numb, numb. Somebody threw me a comp for uh, SmackDown at the Garden. It felt like penance for sins I committed in previous lifetimes. <laughs> I sat there. I was numb, okay? And you have to understand, I sat in that same building, maybe that same seat. There's Tiger Mask against Dynamite Kid. There's oh Jimmy God. Snooker jumping off the, jumping off the cage on Morocco. There's Billy Graham and Bruno, which was meat and potatoes in comparison, but the charisma was so off the chart, the building was shaking. Right. The building was shaking, okay? <laughs> so, Roddy Piper, heel Roddy Piper, mid-80s, the building would shake. Basically, Piper would come out, and 10 minutes later, 12 minutes later, whatever it was, it's like you could breathe again. You could breathe again. That's how exciting it was. Okay, Piper and Snooker. Piper, Piper and Orton teaming up. You know, uh, it was unbelievable. And then you're sitting there, you know, and they're just going through the motions. This match is two and a half stars. This match is two stars. This match is three stars. And blaring sound and videos and a sea of kids, little kids with their families, instead of, you know, this blue-collar crowd that I grew up on. And, you know, it's, it's like the soul was taken out. It's corporate. It's absolutely yeah. corporate. Yeah. And um, Which doesn't mean that on WrestleMania Day, AJ, Star, AJ Styles won't have a four-star match or whatnot. But, um... You're going to have to sit through 17 other numbing matches to get to that. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, again, um, I, I love a lot of today's wrestling. I get annoyed at the old school fans. Uh, there, there's been no good wrestling since Harley Race in the 80s. But what are you talking about? Watch Okada. Watch Naito. Watch uh, Tanahashi. You know what I'm saying? It's like there's plenty of great wrestling in 2020. You have to search it out. You know? Sure. Think the music people are the same. There's been no good music since the Beatles. <laughs> Just shut up. Shut up. It's ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous that's that's the thing i think people still want it fisted you know handed to them you know on a silver platter or whatever you if you search up new japan and you pay the nine dollars and 99 cents a month or whatever it is which uh, i do yeah i do i support it yeah it's unbelievable it really is there's so many little networks out there for 4.99 2.99 do some homework you'll find that wwe isn't the only thing out there Exactly. One other. Um, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no. I was just gonna say uh, one other quick question. Um, did you get to try Ox Baker's shepherd pie? Did he? Were you there when he was cooking uh, for me? I wasn't there for that uh, shoot. We we did so many shoots. I wasn't there. No, okay. But uh, I've met Ox Baker many times, and uh, that again, that that was not shtick. That was him. This guy was. So over the top, charismatic and outgoing and loud and boisterous. That was him. And um, Ox, um, Ox was another guy who was not a great, great wrestler, but he was a great, great heel. He he had tremendous charisma, tremendous. And uh, he started a riot. You go on YouTube, pull up Ox Baker riot, and you see, you see the whole building like pouring into the ring and throwing stuff it's insane okay so heat like that you know you, you just can't find anymore very rare very rare all right one final question and this is a big one this is a big sure. one who do you think is sure. going to win this year's royal rumble to keep to wrap it right around back into today's wrestling who are you picking um well you, you gotta go with um 
I would think McMahon's man crush Roman Reigns if he's in it, right? I, I don't follow it that closely. Is Reigns in it? I don't know. He's probably going to be in it. Yeah, I was I was just checking All that. Right, so. Yeah. I would agree. You gotta, you gotta go. You gotta go. With, you gotta go with Reigns because you know who McMahon pushes, and uh, uh, or McMahon has a thing for Corbin, Baron Corbin, who's like like a vast vacuum of non charisma of all the guys. That's McMahon <laughs> with the big man fetish, you know. I'd rather have paper oh. cuts in between my fingers and watch any one of their matches. Oh my God! All right. I'll, t- I'll tell you guys something. My best friend is a dentist, and I tell people I would rather have fruit canal than watch Raw. And I mean that because I go, I go to my friend, and we actually laugh and have a good time. I would rather have root canal than watch Raw. So, uh, yeah. Evan, you've given us uh, more time than we asked for. Um, Thank you so, so much for joining us. This is therapeutic for me. This is like therapy. I enjoy this. For us, too. Yeah, it really is. We we enjoyed every moment of this. And I don't know, do you, you know, you're you're in Brooklyn, you're in Queens, you're up in New York. Uh, The big event is coming in March 7th up around there where it's it's a WrestleCon type of deal thing. Do you do you go to those? Um, We'd love to possibly meet up with you when we're up there, you know, go out for lunch or something just to... Say thanks. Yeah, that would be that would be fun. Um, I don't know if I'm working the big events. Sometimes we work with Greg Valentine and promote the movie at these things. We will be. We haven't announced it yet. You're the first guys to hear this. We'll be at WrestleCon in uh, Tampa for WrestleMania weekend, and uh, we're going to have J.J. Dillon and one other legend to be announced. So uh, you can come say hi to me there. WrestleCon in uh, Tampa. I believe that's the 3rd and 4th of April off the top of my head. But um, I'm not sure if I'll be at the big event, but I live in Queens, so we could have breakfast or lunch or dinner before or after, whatever. That would be amazing. There. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah, well, uh, off the air, we'll, uh, we'll be in contact with you and everything, um, I don't know, a week before or so, all right? Yeah, awesome, awesome. That'll be fun. And, and, I, and again... I want to thank you for the support of 350 Days. When when all is said and done, it's an independent film. And, uh, you know, we have Bret Hart and Billy Graham and Ted DiBiase and Valentine and Tito and all these legends. But really, it's an independent film. And, you know, we appreciate people getting the word out and, you know, positive word of mouth. And that's what's going to keep it, you know, growing and, um, you know, Thank you for taking this much time with me. It's really gracious that you appreciate it. Absolutely. And we, we loved it, guys, uh, listeners. 350 Days. It is an awesome wrestling documentary. If you haven't seen it yet, you need to see it. Um, it is, uh, it's about life on the road. And it's actually everything life-changing. That goes changing. From what I watched, it was life-changing. It really is. And, and that's not an overstatement at all. Uh, Evan, once again, thank, thank you, you so, sir. so much for coming on uh, the Can Crusher Spotlight. Oh, my pleasure, guys. Thanks so much. Anytime. If you need me down the road, I'm happy to do it. I could trash Raw or whatever you need. <laughs> Mark, do you think I dropped enough references to being from New York and uh, being an actor? I'm shocked you didn't tell him you went to WrestleMania. Oh, oh, my God. How could I have forgotten that? Right? Yeah. Well, he's going to listen, I'm sure, to yeah. see what we have to say about everything. But, uh, Mr. Ginsburg, yes, he was at WrestleMania 1. I was, and I was at the event. Two weeks before that, Madison Square Garden, when uh, Jimmy Snooker jumped off of Andre the Giant's back shoulder. Real we quick. should real quick, real quick, get him back on the phone. All right. Uh, what an amazing interview! I, I, there's things that it still have not processed through my mind that we just talked with Mr. Ginsburg about. Yeah, uh, it really was. This, um, if I may say so, the quote Arn Anderson, not to toot my own horn, but toot toot. This is one of our better interviews, Mark. This was uh, phenomenal. Well, we had nothing to do with it. Right. It was, no, it was all, honestly, it was all Mr. Ginsburg's information that he brought to the table. Um, his perspective on creating art and how much he loves the wrestling business. The appreciation and respect he has for the men and women who, who put their lives on the line. And, and that's that's not an overstatement, guys. Watch the documentary if you haven't watched it. These people put their lives on the line to entertain us. Um, and some of them are doing pretty well now and, and had lives after that, and, and some of them did it. And I love how he's true to form with the WWE fanboys. He knows 
the business still. He does. And, you know, we try not to to call out fans for what they like or don't like, but it's hard not to agree with him. You know, you like wrestling. You like what you like. You like the promotion you like. That's absolutely fine. There's no need broaden to... Broaden your horizons. Yeah, broaden your horizons. And don't crap on what anybody else likes. Yeah, and that goes not just to fanboys. That goes to... I'll say it so you don't have to be linked to it. That goes to other podcasts, other people with podcasts bigger than ours that just have to crap on things. It's because we're on their radar. We are on their radar. I'm telling you, we say things, Mark, and the next week we see it on TV. Yep, they're they're listening to it. They're listening. So, uh, once again, thank you, Mr. Ginsburg, for coming on the show. It was amazing. Uh, I'm excited that we might run into him when we go to the big event. That would be a lot of fun. Um, you know, he mentioned he doesn't know if he's going to be there, but there might be an opportunity uh, for us to hook up, which would be very cool. Yeah. So, all right, John, what else you got to say? That's about it. This was amazing. This was great. Yeah. This, this was great. Guys, if you want to hear more like that, send us some emails. Um, who to reach out to at cancrusher69 at gmail.com. Find us on all the Facebook and the instagram and twitter and you know you know the whole routine and you can listen to us everywhere the podcasts are available so john just remember uh just because you're trash doesn't mean you can't do great things it's called a garbage can mark not a garbage cannot (laughs) 